YouTube. Yeah, that was me humping a ruck with a tump. Get your mind out of the gutter. Now, I'm putting this in the History of Gear series, uh, even though uh, I didn't originally plan on including the Duluth pack. We'll get into it in the history of gear because uh, that playlist, this playlist, is relegated for the history of gear of the 20th century. Now, the pack, the Duluth pack, was invented by a guy named Camille Poirier. Yeah, he was French said his name funny, you know, like he had a better job or something, spelled poorier. Uh, he had emigrated to uh, the uh, North America and spent his time uh, bopping back and forth between the United States and Canada and, and back and forth uh, for several years. And uh, by 1882, he had settled in Duluth, Minnesota. And he had undoubtedly, during those years, been exposed to canoe trekking, transportation of himself or goods, getting from point A to point B using a canoe. Transportation and infrastructure of the 1870s being what it was at the time. So he would have been exposed to uh, two things that were common during that time. One was carrying a big bag open at the top without any form or frame, what we call today a rucksack, and a method of carrying heavy loads that had been used by cultures across the planet for centuries, which is the tump line. Now, what the tump line was originally designed as was just a long line, basically a big circle, really, where in one part had a wide spot place to put across your forehead. And then you would lay out your load in a piece of canvas or hide, fill that up, and roll it with the tump line inside, and then you would tie it. Okay? And then you would put that on your head, and the load would be carried, the, the weight of the load would be carried uh, by your spine. It would be transferred to your spine. The idea was is that your whole body would be carrying the load, not just your shoulders. Uh, it was used by cultures across the planet from Asia, North America, the South America, and we even know that. Uh, Eastern European populations, particularly Armenians, were using tump lines during the prehistoric period. Okay, skeletal remains have been found where the cranium, the skull, had been deformed by use of a tump line. That told us two things. One, they were using tump lines. Two, they were doing it in an early age early enough to provide enough pressure to change the shape of the skull, which isn't fully formed until you're about 10, 11 years old, something like that. I'm not a scientist. 
But the practice doesn't seem to have gotten to Western Europe. So when the Western Europeans reached the Western Hemisphere, the French, the British, the Dutch, uh, they encountered the use of these tump lines to carry heavy loads. Now the practice wasn't good for long distance carry of the loads. Pretty obvious. Uh, it worked better for short distances, which worked in perfectly for the Native American populations of the northern tier of the United States and Canada, the southern tier of Canada, because the principal means of transportation when the Europeans first got to this hemisphere was by canoe on rivers and lakes. You could carry tremendous loads in a canoe. Uh, some of them you could carry thousands of pounds. But if you're traveling in, on rivers in that area of the continent, there's not really a straight line. You have to stop and get out of your canoe and carry it across a piece of land, or around rapids, or around a waterfall. And that's a process we know as portaging. And what you would do is you would take your goods that were inside these packs that had tump lines attached to them, inside them, carry the canoe on your shoulders and strap that pack to your head and you could carry both at the same time short distances. Now sometimes these portages were hundreds of yards, sometimes they were miles. Okay, and you might have to make several trips back and forth in order to transfer your whole load and your canoe. So for the first couple of centuries of uh, the history of uh, the Western Hemisphere, tump lines were used in uh, commercial ventures, transporting goods from the interior to the coast. Okay? By the 20th century, the need for transporting goods by canoe had pretty much disappeared. Now, Camille Poirier, it's spelled Poirier, but Camille Poirier was a shoemaker, and he arrived in the uh, Western Hemisphere in about the late 1860s, early 1870s, and he sought his fortune, and did he bop back and forth between Canada and the United States, mostly Michigan and Minnesota. As such, he would have been exposed to canoe trekking, transportation by canoe, because even by the 18, 1870s, it was still the principal means of transportation in many areas of the country, of the continent. So when he got to Duluth, Minnesota, in about 1881, he decided he made an invention. He was going to patent an invention, something he had in his head. Now, I'm going to uh, put the picture that accompanied his patent application up here on the screen, and I'm going to do it a little bit longer than I normally do for stills, because there is something in this picture I want you to see that is above and beyond the tump line. So take a look. Now, Poirier's invention was not necessarily an invention. He took two things that were in common use. A big bag to carry stuff in and the tump line to carry heavy loads. And what he did was he put the two of them together. This is the first time that a tump line could be used without rolling it inside of a pack. 
He said, you guys are carrying this big sack and you're carrying these tump lines. Why not put the two of them together? So what he did was he attached the tump line to the back of the pack where the shoulder straps were. And it's adjustable in case you get a short or a long neck. And now you could load up your pack and carry it with a tump line. Okay, now what you can do is you can load several packs of varying size in your canoe. Here's another one. It's a little bit bigger than that other pack. So you can get several different sizes of these packs. Load the small ones towards the uh, aft and bow portion of the canoe where it's skinny and then have progressively larger packs going to the center of the canoe. And then when you portage, things are a little bit easier because you can carry your canoe and you have a pack that you can put on your head. I know, it's not a great idea, but it was the only one they had at the time. So, by the 20th century, the use of a canoe to transport commercial goods had pretty much disappeared. Uh, there were much better methods to transport goods via water, uh, you know, paddle wheel steamboats. But if you wanted to get into the back country, because by this time people are starting, the city folk are starting to come into the woods. If you want to get away from them, you want to get further back in the woods. And one of the best ways to do that is by canoe. You go where the roads don't go. So for about the first three decades of the 20th century, the Tump Line was in use pretty much extensively by canoe trekkers. Uh, we see a lot of illustrations and photographs of people using Tump Lines uh, to travel via canoe trekking. Now as far as the Duluth Pack goes, uh, writers of the period, Horace Kephart and Warren Miller, uh, say that it's a perfectly serviceable pack without the tump line. And I assume that they're, they're talking to uh, people who are uh, looking at more uh, weekend foot trekking uh, loads of around 40 to 60 pounds uh, that you could carry on your back relatively comfortably without the need of a tump line. And it was perfectly serviceable until uh, 1921 when the Trapper Nelson and the uh, Bergen pack become po start becoming popular. Uh, a frame pack is a good deal better for carrying loads of 40 to 60 pounds uh, than the uh, Duluth pack is. Today, uh, the Duluth pack is pretty much relegated to uh, a fashion item uh, used and worn or carried by hipster wannabes who wear red plaid wool shirts without knowing why the wool plaid shirts are red. There, I said it. Ah, uh, but what about that thing I told you to look for in the... Uh, patent illustration. Anybody catch it? It didn't seem to make it to the production version. I have not found anything showing this particular feature of Camille Poirier's patent illustration. It's this right here. Now what that is, is what we call today the sternum strap. Today, it, it holds your shoulder straps together, compresses on the chest, makes a pack a whole lot more comfortable. Today, you can't sell a pack that doesn't have a sternum strap. And the interesting thing is, 
that the uh, credit for inventing the sternum strap goes to Greg Lowe, who has also received credit for inventing the uh, internal frame pack. But if you've been watching the History of Gear series and seen this video, you know that uh, Sean Dyer has told us that the first internal frame pack was a Boy Scout pack made in the 20s and the 30s. This is why studying the history of gear using from uh, a, a standpoint of living history, experiential archaeology, and looking at the material culture of the time can help you understand how the inventions of the present and near present came about. So, the study of camping gear history lacks a good deal of scholarship. I hope this little addition kind of helps to clear things up a little bit and we stop congratulating ourselves for inventing stuff that was made a hundred years ago. We'll see you down the trail. Thank you.